Good morning. Good morning, Fayette. We've got the Hardy here today. A couple of weeks ago, I had a chance to come up here and, and uh, talked about uh, one of the greatest praise and worship songs that has yet to be written. Uh, and uh, I'm going to start off with that again. <laughs> You know, verse 1 of that song says, it's been a long, cold, lonely winter. All right? How many can relate with that? All right? Phys you know, uh, physically, you know, after yesterday, um, you know, it certainly feels that way, you know. But uh, let's face it, what's 20 inches of snow? You know, we're, we're Mainers, for crying out loud. We can deal with 20 inches of snow. What, is it, what does it mean when you have 20 inches of snow? No. Yeah, just ride your snowmobile into church like Eric up there. So, you know, we can do that in Maine. Those of you that are watching online, we actually can ride our snowmobiles to church. So, uh, and uh, it's been, been a little crazy here. But more importantly, uh, how about spiritually? All right? To me, uh, it's, it, it feels like it's been a long, cold, lonely winter. And, you know, it kind of reminds me of Narnia. Remember Narnia? Always winter and never Christmas. You know, when you look and you open the news and you, you, wherever you get your news from and you see the darkness and the corruption, immorality, uh, deceit, you know, dishonesty all around us. And you don't know what to trust, um, you know, or what to believe. You know, last summer I had an opportunity to share a message uh, you know, from this pulpit on Matthew 24. And Matthew 24 talks about the end of the age. And it mentions a few things like wars, rumors of war, famine, earthquakes, pestilence. Any of that sound familiar? Okay. Last week, Roger Labby shared with us, it's later than you think. Okay, by the way, that was an absolutely awesome message. If you weren't here, if you didn't get a chance to see Roger's message, check it out online on YouTube. It was absolutely fantastic, and he just uh, did a fantastic job delivering it. But it is. It, it's later than you think. It's later than we think. But it's time. that means it's time for the church to stand up and be the church. And I think that's what Roger's message was all about last week. You know, it's been said that when the dark gets darker, the light shines brighter. All right, church, we are the light, and, you know, we've got to start making sure we're letting it shine. Verse 3, verse 3 of that same song goes, <clears throat> it goes something like this, the ice is slowly melting, okay? Uh, it's been a long, long time since it's been clear. Have you been paying attention lately? Have you noticed what's happening in the spiritual realm? There are a lot of things going on. Just here at Fayette Baptist Church, we've seen tremendous growth uh, in our body since, you know, post-COVID. Today may not be an, ex an example of that, but generally speaking, we've had some tremendous growth in this body. Pastor Jeff was up here a few months ago, and he was sharing, and he'll sh be sharing again today, but he shared a list of prayer requests and all the answers we've had to those prayer requests. This is a praying church, and there is power in prayer. We've seen an increasing amount of unity in our fellowship, which is a blessing to God. We've seen many people coming to faith. We've seen new families, new babies, new friendships formed. We've got a, a, a large contingent of our body right now in Mexico sharing the light of Christ to those in Mexico. We have men coming together, growing and encouraging, challenging each other to, to walk in godly ways and, in, and to, to step into their godly roles. Uh, the Armor Bearers Conference coming up in, in uh, June this year. Men, if you haven't signed up for that, you need to. It's gonna be a tremendous opportunity for us to continue to grow together. Think of the Ignite and the young people growing and being discipled. There's a lot of hope out there, just in, and that's in Fayette Baptist Church. In Maine, 
You know, we're, we're seeing, uh, my wife and I have had a chance to be part of a, of a pro process that is bringing hundreds of believers from churches all around the state together, training them and equipping them to stand up and speak up for life. On Friday night, Mercy Me performed to a pack house in, in Portland. All right? There's a lot of great stuff happening nationwide. Have you heard about what's going on in Kentucky? Okay? That's the good news is that's spreading all over the country, all over the world, in other colleges and other churches all over the place. Um, we just, my wife and I just had a chance to visit, uh, go watch the Jesus Revolution movie that just came out. Tremendous presentation of the power of the gospel of Christ. You know, think of the, the impact the chosen has had on so many people, so many people coming to know the Lord. So there's things happening. There's movement afoot. We are, you know, and, and we have a role in the next great revival. And, and you know, and, and I've studied, uh, you know, I've read from a lot of different people. Revival in a nation has to start first in the church. Okay? But revival in a church has to start first in each individual's heart. And that's what our challenge is, is to, to, to bring the light of Christ into a dark world that needs it more than ever and is more receptive to it than it has ever been before. So as we, we invest this next couple of hours, let's, let's let that light shine. Let's raise up the name of Jesus Christ and let's give him all the honor and glory that is due his name. So join us in worship. Yeah, like I all said, uh, um, we have a team in Mexico. A year ago, I was with that team, and one of the things that I had the opportunity to do was I got to play with the worship team from the church in Cuadratola. And, you know, I was kind of excited to do it. And they gave me this guitar, and, you know, it was a little iffy, a little sketchy. Uh, I started to tune it, and it almost made it up to tune. So I kind of had to play the strings that worked. Um, but what happened at, at that service, it was just one of the greatest uh, times of worship that I've had. We would sing in Spanish, and then he would, the worship leader at the church would give me this look, and I'd, okay, I'll sing in English. And, uh, but the, the worship was just amazing that day. It just made me think about how God can take things that, like an out of tune guitar, and use them for his glory. So, you know, sometimes we think we're great, but a lot of times we're just out of tune guitars, and we need God, so let's sing together. Strong. 
me Who brings our chaos back into order Who makes the earth a son and daughter The King of glory, the King of glory
God is greater.
please have a seat. As we sing this last song, the, the folks will pass out the elements for communion.
Seth, can you put that uh, slide back up? It says, forgiveness was bought. Yes, sir. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Keep looking at that. Because what I'm about to say, you may not like. But what I want you to hear is that. You may not hear that. I'm going to take communion out of 1 Corinthians 11. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself, and in so doing, he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. So what would be an unworthy manner, you might ask? I'm sure you're looking for a grocery list, but I'm not going to make you a grocery list. You make your own grocery list. But just so that I don't miss anything, an unworthy manner is simply anything that causes a broken fellowship with God. Anything that causes a broken fellowship with God. You know what it is. You know what breaks fellowship with your spouse, with your kids, with your boss, with your friends, your co-workers. You know what it is. Also, but a man must examine himself. Psalm 139 says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts. And see if there be any hurtful way in me. And lead me in an everlasting way. Psalm 26 says, Examine me, O Lord, and try me. Test my mind and my heart, for your loving kindness is before my eyes. As you and I examine ourselves, and ask God to examine us as well, you should be able to determine that fellowship with God is in the right standing or not. 1 John 1, 5 through 2, 2, pretty much says it all. This is a message we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness. If we say that we have fellowship, if we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. 
But if we walk in the light, as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Amen. If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves. In other words, if we say we don't have a grocery list, right? <laughs> We're deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Hallelujah. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for us only, but also for those of the whole world. February 17th, if you read the Daily Bread, and you probably don't remember what you read on that day, if you do. <laughs> but uh, Adam Holtz wrote this. He was coming from Isaiah 60. Four, six, but he said, recently my wife and I were cleaning our house before having guests over. I noticed some dark stains on our white kitchen tile floor, the kind that required getting on my knees to scrub. But I soon had a sinking realization, the more I scrubbed, the more I noticed other stains. <laughs> Each stain I eliminated only made the others that much more obvious. Our kitchen floor suddenly seemed impossibly dirty. And with each moment, I realized no matter how hard I worked, I can never get this floor completely clean. Scripture says something similar about sinful cleansing. Our best efforts at dealing with sin on our own always fall short. Seeming to despair of God's people, the Israelites ever experiencing God's salvation. The prophet Isaiah wrote, all of us become like one who is unclean and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. But Isaiah knew there is always hope through God's goodness. So he prayed, you Lord are our father, we are the clay, you are the potter. He knew that God alone can cleanse what we cannot until the deepest stains are white as snow. We can't scrub away the smudges and smears of sin on our souls. Thankfully, we can receive salvation in the one who sacrifice allows us to be cleansed completely. And to quote, the deepest confession you will make is not of a particular sin, but the deepest confession you will make is your need for what this bread and this cup represent. Acknowledging our sins before God is biblical, but the greater acknowledgement is the confession that Jesus takes away those sins we confess through the cross. His body and blood, the bread and the cup. And remember when Jesus was at the table with his disciples and he washed their feet and he just said, I'll wash my whole body, but he said, you don't need to wash your whole body. Or I have cleansed you. You just need to wash your feet. We know that the flesh and the spirit, they do battle against each other all day long, don't they? We're duking it out. You think when it's hard and long, the Christian life is light and hard and long. <laughs> so, in light of that, Jesus cleanses us as we go through the world and we get dirty. So continue on in 1 Corinthians 11, it says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, we thank you, Lord Jesus, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it. Remember for me, 
For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us pray. Precious, precious Heavenly Father, we are eternally grateful for your love, for your forgiveness for revealing yourself to us, for calling us, for providing a sacrificial lamb who is spotless to cleanse us from our sin that has broken fellowship with you, without which we would be lost forever. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Hear our prayer, O Lord, that we might glorify you in all that we do, all that we say, Please minister to those who this day and this week are facing what seems like insurmountable mountains before them. Might be those who are facing surgery this week, those who are undergoing treatments for themselves, for their family members, For the loved ones, we pray that you would touch and heal each one. For those, Lord, who have lost loved ones recently, we pray for them. Pray for those who are dealing with family members who are slipping away, as we all will one day. For those of us who are dealing with family members and children who have gone their own way, bring them back, Lord. Reveal yourself to them. Open their eyes to see your love, your forgiveness that is provided even through what we just celebrated, through communion. We want to lift up those 14 team members who are in Mexico this week. We pray for thy protection upon them from health and from any obstacles that might prevent them from carrying out the mission that you have planned for them. We pray for them, Lord. We pray for their families as well, those who stayed home. Thank you, Lord, for Pastor Jeff and the message he will bring. Pray that you would speak through him. Thank you for the Sunday school teachers and the helpers. We pray for the children, that their eyes and ears and hearts would be open to hear your message. And we even pray that for ourselves, Lord. Help us to draw closer to you. We pray and commit the rest of this service unto you. We pray and commit this week unto you, Lord. We do declare that Jesus Christ is Lord. Lord of all. And in his precious name, we pray. Amen.
Just a couple of announcements, quick announcements. Um, there are prayer cards around that look like that, okay? And we would encourage you to take one and pray faithfully for the 14 members who are in Cuatatola, Mexico, for the next 10 days or so. Pray for them, pray for their families, pray for their ministry there, and pray for the people who they're ministering to. Pray that they would be given opportunities as the Lord leads and as the Holy Spirit opens up opportunities. Please pray for them. We would also um, let you know that the ladies will be meeting. Uh, ladies have a night for the women's ministry on Wednesday, March 15th. It will be at 6 p.m. And it's going to be at the Weather Vane restaurant in Reedfield. You do need to sign up. And there's a sign-up sheet in the cafe. And there's also a link in the email uh, that was sent out if you're on the email list. And it's a good reminder that if you aren't on the email list, um, why not? <laughs> um, we do encourage you, though, to call the church office um, and sign up for the email that comes out every Friday. But there's a link there that you can sign up for the women's ministry. Last but almost not least, um, spring is coming, believe it or not. May not seem like it today, but um, next Sunday, we spring ahead. So don't forget, don't be late, okay? So even though we lose an hour, um, we will move ahead next weekend. So change your clocks. And I said that was last, but I've got one more. Please remember that snow falls off the roof. It slides. It can be really dangerous um, if you happen to be underneath that. Um, so please be aware of that and make sure that your children um, are also aware. Okay? And at this time, we're going to take a short break. Five minutes, uh, greet someone around you, and the children are dismissed to Sunday school.
fun to be back up here. Um, you know, Chris usually has his time at the beginning of the sermon. He gets to talk about some things that are going on and some things that are on his heart. And um, I figure, why not? It's my turn. <laughs> um, and so I just want to, Charlie reminded me, thank you, Charlie, for praying for the teachers in the Sunday school classrooms. And um, you know, it's an it's a area of ministry that I think is often overlooked um, by, well, by a lot of folks. Um, uh, because they have their own separate part of the church, and they're in their own building even, and they have their own little corner. And I just want to really quickly recognize, especially right now, um, just Bob Barry and Brenda Ridley, who for the last 10 weeks, 10 consecutive weeks, did a double shift, um, and they've been teaching nonstop. And today is their 10th week, so um, when you see them, give them a pat on the back, say thank you um, for their service for the kids and to the Lord. Um, and well done, Bob and Brenda, whenever you get a chance to listen to this. And now, um, well, as we think about the text that I'm going to look at today, um, I was praying on it for a while, and as I read Ephesians 3, it just, it just stood out to me, and I thought, oh my goodness, there's just there's so much gold here that I can cover. I've got to preach on Ephesians 3. And so then I texted um, uh, really a mentor of mine and uh, told him what I was going to be preaching on Ephesians 3 and asked if he had any resources that I could use in my preparation, and he sent me just well, a lot of stuff. Uh, he sent me some stuff and said, well, you know, there is a lot there in Ephesians 3. So uh, on his advice, he said, okay, well, maybe I'll, I'll cut it in half, and I'll do the first half of Ephesians 3 one week, and then next week I'll preach on the second half of Ephesians 3. And then I started going through it again, and I said, well, there is a lot there. <laughs> so this week, we will be looking at the first six verses of Ephesians 3, and then Lord willing, next week we will be looking at... Um, uh, all the way up through verse 13. And I say Lord willing because I've learned my lesson. Um, last March, I said I for sure am going to be preaching uh, the next week on Titus. And then the next day, my wife had a baby. So I'm not making that mistake again. Um, Lord willing, we'll carry on with Ephesians after that. And then next week, we'll still have plenty of left to go in Ephesians 3. So whenever the Lord calls me to come back up here and preach again, we'll just we'll keep going with Ephesians 3 whenever that may be. Will you join me in prayer? Oh, Lord, we just, Lord, I thank you for your word today that you are bringing us. Lord, thank you for the calling that you put on my heart to bring the word of Ephesians 3 uh, to this church, to this body. Lord, I just ask for a blessing over it, ask that my words would be your words, and that there would be nothing out of my mouth that you do not want me to share. Lord, we just thank you for well, the purpose that we're going to see in this verse, or in these verses, in this chapter, and I pray that we would all leave here today changed. We would all leave here today uh, with a greater understanding of where and how and who you call us to. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and pull it out, and we're going to look at uh, Ephesians 3, 1 through 6. We're going to dive right into it. So Ephesians 3, starting in verse 1. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, written brief, uh, as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations and as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promised in Jesus Christ through the gospel. 
Well, getting right into it, I want you guys to look at verse 1 with me in your Bibles. All right, read that again. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles. And so immediately, if we want to understand what Paul is talking about here, we have to ask ourselves, what is this reason that he's referring to? Because Paul is on the verge of saying something really important. And so on the basis of what he's about to say and pray for, it depends on what he's already outlined in the first two chapters. Because of everything that I've said previously, I, Paul, am going to tell you something. So we need to look, what did Paul say? Now, it really is. It's everything that has been outlined in chapters one and chapters two. And we don't have time to go through both chapters in depth, but there is so much gold. I've already said that in these verses. So I encourage you, go home and read the entirety of chapters one and two to get a better understanding of what I'm talking about. But I do want you to look at verses 19 to 22 in particular in chapter two. So look at that. It's just right before what we read. And he says, so then you, and that is the Gentile believers, are no longer strangers and aliens. Right? From whom? Well, you're about to find out. But you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure, that is the whole body of believers, being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. And then verse 22 is what he immediately begins to build off of in chapter 3. In him, that is in God, in Christ, in Jesus, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So just consider with me Paul's audience for a moment. Right? On one hand, you have God's chosen people. You have the Israelites. You have the Jews. And I think it's natural, especially for in Paul's day, to understand that the Jewish Messiah came and brought salvation to the Jewish people. That's no surprise to anybody. But here Paul is writing to the Gentiles in particular. And that is everybody who is not born an Israelite Jew. And then he spends chapter 1 just outlining this, this amazing, this spectacular picture of salvation. And then how in verse 4 he chose us before the foundation of the world and how we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of sins, and we are just lavished in grace, sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. How Christ came and died and was raised from the dead and seated him at the right hand of the Father in the heavenly places forever and ever. Those are all Paul's words. And that's all just in chapter one. And before the reader stops and considers and thinks, well, are you sure you wrote to the right church? Um, because we're Gentiles. You know, you're talking about your own people, Paul but not us, surely. And then there are plenty of promises to the Israelites, surely, but, but us? And then you get to chapter two. And look at it with me. We're just going to run through it. Right? Verse one, he says that you were dead. Okay, that sounds more like us. Right? You were dead. And then verse three, among whom we all, and I want you guys just to circle that word all if you have a pen or pencil with you. Because um, remember, Paul is a Jew, and he's writing to Gentiles, so he's including himself in with the Gentiles there, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh. And then verse 4, but God being rich in mercy, verse 5, made us, again, us alive together. Verse 6, raised us up with him. Verse 8, for by grace you, Gentiles, have been saved through faith. Verse 10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that who we should walk in them. In verse 12, you Gentiles were separated from Christ at one point having no hope. And then 13, you have been brought near to Christ. Verse 14, it's no longer you or us, it's he himself is our peace who has made us both one. Verse 16, he reconciles us both, Jew and Gentile, to God in one body. And verse 18, for through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. And then we're back to 19. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. In chapter 3, verse 1, for this reason, for everything that I just said, 
I, Paul. Because there is no longer any division concerning salvation in Jesus Christ between the Jews and between the Gentiles. I, Paul. Because all people groups are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. I, Paul, have something to say to you. But he, he doesn't immediately go into what he wants to say. Look at that carefully. He digresses. Look at your Bibles, verse 1. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles, and then maybe you see that dash at the end of that sentence. All right, he breaks off and he starts going down this rabbit trail. So we have to ask ourselves, why is that? Why is Paul going off on this rabbit trail? Clearly, Paul's on a roll here. He's given an obvious and this just incredibly worded picture of grace and the gospel and salvation to all people groups, and then he breaks mid-sentence to clarify something, and that's going to bring us to our first point, first of three points. So point number one, there is purpose in all things. Paul saw his purpose in prison. Now, to get an idea of um, uh, what we or it may have given Paul reason to shed light on something and stop his train of thought, look at what he wrote that needed some clarification. I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles. Well, think about that for a minute, because Paul introduced himself already in the first verse of this book. He said, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, Ephesians 1.1. And that introduction is important for other reasons, but he could have just said, for this reason, I, blank, and then go right into his statement. And then in fact, when he resumes his um, train of thought in verse 14, that's exactly what he does. He's going to say, for this reason, I bow my knees. So there is significance in the way Paul brings us into chapter 3. Why he starts off with I, Paul. And so you should know that, especially to the original reader, there is a very personal tone here. Right? This is near, and this is dear to Paul's heart. It's entirely involved, and it's intertwined in Paul's own mission. The original readers would have understood that. What Paul is going to say is not something that should be taken lightly. Now, just It's solemn, even. Imagine for a second that I come up here to give announcements on a Sunday morning like I usually do, and, and I start off and I say, I, Jeff, your pastor, your friend, you're going to know right away that what I'm about to say is not your average announcement. I'm not going to tell you how to sign up for the Ebola tomb with that next sentence. Um, whatever I say next is going to be deeply personal. It's going to be connected. It's going to be about my own self, my own purpose, and it's going to draw all of you in to listen to me, won't it? And so for this reason, I, Paul, and then he says, a prisoner of Christ Jesus. And that is a strange title to give yourself, isn't it? Is he literally a prisoner of Christ Jesus in that moment? Well, on one hand, no. No, in reality, he was imprisoned. But it would have been under Caesar. It would have been under the Roman emperor Nero, or rather somebody acting on his behalf. So why didn't he just say, I, Paul, a prisoner of Nero? What is Paul trying to convey when he claims that he's not a prisoner of Caesar? Or Caesar? No, he's a prisoner of Christ Jesus. Well, I grew up on a pumpkin farm. This is going to connect. <laughs> um, weird fact about me. And so in May, uh, we planted. Uh, I'd spent what felt like every second of June weeding around each individual plant by hand, and sometimes we'd go out, kill some squash bugs, and uh, before the harvest, we'd cut the vines. And at the end of the season, I would have kept a log of my hours worked. I roughly rounded up. Um, and then uh, they would take a portion of the sales from the pumpkins, and I'd get about $3 for every hour that summer. And my dad always said there were no child labor laws in family farms. <laughs> and so at the end of the summer, a few hundred bucks felt pretty good. And then one summer, I remember my grandfather sat me down um, before handing me my pay, and he looked me in the eye, and he said something along the line of, oh, now, Jeffrey, you know whose money this really is, don't you? When I sighed and said, yes, it's yours, Grandpa. Um, and then he laughed and said, well, no, no, it's not. Uh, it belongs to who? To the Lord. And in my mind, I was taking from 
my grandfather. In a sense, I was taking from my grandfather. It was his money, my parents' money that they were giving to me. Uh, but as far as my grandfather was concerned, every penny that he gave me belonged completely and totally to God. And that was the lesson, that was the point he was trying to get across to me in that moment. Um, it wasn't his, it was the Lord's. And so in Paul's case, though he was held in one sense in prison by Roman authorities, in Paul's mind, he was held entirely, completely captive to one man, not Nero, but Jesus Christ. Paul was held captive by Christ. His life is completely, utterly, entirely subject to the will of his captor, and that is Jesus Christ, not Nero. That is his, his identity. He was once dead in his trespasses, in bondage to sin, but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, which he loved Paul, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us, and he made Paul, alive together with Christ. By grace, Paul had been saved. Paul wrote those words earlier in this book, and he took his own words seriously, doesn't he? So my question is, do we take those words seriously? Are we comfortable with that idea? Am I comfortable, Jeff Culpitz, with that idea that I am a prisoner of Christ Jesus? Is that a title that I would willingly and gladly give to myself? Well, how valuable is this mission that we have? Are we so enthralled with the good news of Jesus Christ that we can't help but call ourselves Christ no matter the situation that we're in, no matter where it may take us? So I am praying, I am begging even, please don't forget how important this is and the words that we are about to read are. We are tempted, all of us, myself included, to minimalize the eternal, to minimalize the life-changing, life-saving, God-ordained good news. And then to overemphasize the finite, overemphasize the life-draining and the soul-sucking man-centered messages that we have in the world today. You know, I spent years, years in this church listening and hearing the word faithfully preached week after week, and I praise God for that. Um, but you know what I would do with that teaching? I would sit in those seats and I'd feel a little convicted. I'd wonder if I should change, maybe reprioritize something in my own life. And I'd go home with the word fresh in my mind. I was told how valuable this treasure was. And I say, oh, that's wonderful. I wish I valued it that much. And then I stopped there with a wish and carried on my week like normal until the next Sunday, always wishing, never changing because I couldn't let go of my highest priorities at the time. I'd go home, I'd wish, and in real reality, I'd probably spend the next six hours playing video games, because that's what I cared about. So what is our highest priority in this message? What is your highest priority? I can't answer that question for you right now. So please don't go home wishing that things could be different. That's not what I want you to do tonight. Don't go home wishing things could be different and then carry on as normal. Paul's mission was so precious to him Paul's mission was so incredibly important to him and so necessary to every fiber of his being that he pursued it to the point of imprisonment. And not even that was enough to stop him. And he wasn't asking for pity in prison. No, he was not writing because he wants the Gentiles to feel bad that he's in prison. He was finding purpose in his chains. That jail wasn't a sign of anything going wrong. The jail was a sign of the gospel going right exactly where it was supposed to go. In fact, he mentions imprisonment uh, two more times in Ephesians as a means to further emphasize the gospel even more. Uh, you see it in Ephesians 4, 1. Therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, I urge you. He's a call in attention because of his chains. And in Ephesians 6, 19, he says, I am an ambassador in chains. And what's the purpose? That I might declare the gospel boldly. Paul is not resenting those chains that he is wearing. And why is that? What would lead us to not resent the chains that we are wearing? Well, it's because he never lost sight of the goal. He never lost sight of his purpose. Christ is building a holy temple, Paul says, a dwelling place for God, and there is a spot for you, for the Jews, for the Gentiles, every single tribe and tongue. This is too important to let go of, even in prison. So don't let go of it. That's what I'm begging you today. And so how should we understand that verse that we just read? Well, 
Think of it as, as so of course, I, Paul, who consider myself entirely, completely at the will of Jesus because of you, because of what Christ is doing in you. And that brings us to our second point. Paul's purpose is planned. Paul's purpose is planned. Paul saw purpose in prison because he knew his purpose was planned. The first verse in the whole letter, his introduction, says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. Paul knows, and I want you to know, that God does not sit idly on a throne waiting for events to unfold, hoping that things go generally well. By the will of God, it says, Paul was called to apostleship. By the will of God, he was subsequently called through Paul's faithfulness in his calling to prison. Dwelling on that calling is what brings Paul to break in his thought. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles, verse 2, look at that with me, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you. How the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly. So we need to ask ourselves, what is Paul doing here? Again, it's all right. So he's summarizing uh, the purpose of the first two chapters of Ephesians. And when he mentions his specific call to evangelize to the Gentiles, he has no choice but to interrupt himself and to say, hey, wait a minute, I need to explain some things to you. You do know why I'm a prisoner on your behalf, don't you? You do understand what I meant about the mystery of his will when I wrote about it in chapter 1, verse 9, right? And so the first assumption that Paul makes here is that the reader understands stewardship of God's grace. Paul was, or and the second, rather, assumption is that they understand the authority that Paul is speaking from, that Paul was given revelation to understand a mystery. So there are a few very important words that I want to look at right there. Um, stewardship is one, and then we have mystery and we have revelation. So let's look at the first, back in verse 2. Stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you. All right, here's the important part of the verse. There's an implication behind the word stewardship. Or maybe your Bible might say um, administration. Your Bible might say dispensation. Um, there's a big word. The idea of there being a stewardship of God's grace means essentially that there is a defined strategy for God's grace. The way that this verse is written could have drawn the reader back to Ephesians 1, 9, and 10, where Paul mentions the riches of God's grace, which was lavished upon us. And he says in those verses, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him. To read that God's grace is being stewarded is uh, vital it's necessary to understanding the mystery that Paul is talking about here in these verses. So you can't fully grasp God's grace until you understand that his grace is purposeful. God is active with his grace. Paul was not an afterthought in his redemptive plan. Jesus had Paul in mind. Jesus was given over on that cross for an expressed purpose for Paul. So say that again, Paul was not an afterthought. He had not been given God's grace by chance or by accident. And so don't for a second believe that God would extend grace to somebody and then pull it back and say, oops, I was careless for a moment. Surely you didn't think I meant to give that person grace. I mean, do you have any clue for a minute who Paul was? Well, in 1 Timothy 1, 12 through 15, you don't have to turn there, but listen. This is Paul talking about himself, who he saw himself as. Paul says, I thank him who has given me strength. Christ Jesus, our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointed me to his service. Though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent. But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. Paul was a blasphemer, 
He violently persecuted the church, and he was proud of his zeal in doing so. And he calls himself the foremost sinner, the worst of all sinners. And Paul was not careless with his words. He meant exactly what he said. He was the chief example of sinfulness in his day and age, and yet grace was given to him, the worst of the worst. And now, not only that, he was called to evangelize to a group of people who at one point he wouldn't have even considered touching. But that was part of God's Paul, or God, part of God's plan for Paul. Paul's salvation was not a mistake. And the other two important words were mystery and revelation. And I loved, um, you know, I loved English in school. That was one of my favorite subjects because um, I think there's a lot of power in language and there's a lot of power in words. And so I read words like that and it kind of excites me. Um, you know, in one sense, yes, as a student of scripture and, and someone studying Greek at the moment, um, I pray for that, by the way. But I just meant really more the words sense of mystery and revelation are just exciting to me, right? My wife and I, we love mystery shows and we love mystery books and uh, movies. And I don't mean the I don't want to offend anyone, but I don't mean the NCIS type of mystery stuff, right? But I mean the classic sense of the word, right? We love um, Agatha Christie in particular. Um, Poirot is one of our favorite shows of all time. It's awesome. Um, and so when I hear a word like that, I could be tempted to think of a mystery in the sense of how we would use it at the beginning of one of our books, right? There's been a murder. There are clues, but all we can really do right now at that point in the book is to make our best guess as to what happened. We just don't know for sure. And in fact, if we guess, we're probably going to be wrong. But that is not what Paul means when he's talking about mystery here. Right? So don't think that. Uh, Poirot, one of Agatha Christie's characters, is famous in large part for the way that he resolves his cases. So towards the end of the book, he'll gather all of the suspects in one room, uh, maybe around the dining room table or in the drawing room, and then he'll walk through each suspect one by one, connecting every clue before finally he faces the murderer and lays out exactly how they did it to a T. And then we'll read and we'll go, oh, I get it now. That's so clever. It's so clear. There was this chair that was moved and it concealed the voice recorder that the murderer had used to fool everybody into thinking that the murderer was at a different time so that way he has an alibi. Just, I get it now. It all makes sense now. And the mystery Paul is referring to is something that was previously unknown, likely hinted at, uh, and that has now been clearly and plainly revealed. And so just as another example, I have read Murder on the Orient Express. In one sense, that is still a mystery. I would describe it to anybody as a mystery novel, and that doesn't change anything. But make no mistake, I have no confusion about that book now. There are no unanswered questions for me about that book. I know how the crime was committed. And in fact, I can now read that book from cover to cover and I can have a clearer understanding of how all of those clues pointed to the outcome that was already revealed to me. So don't dismiss the word mystery as something that is beyond our grasp or something that is beyond our understanding. I think too many times we read that and we pass through it and we think it's something that is meant to be far off and kind of um, ethereal, something that we can't quite grasp. Uh, we think we ought to gaze at how intriguing that word is or how intriguing the next thing might come across us. But Paul does. He uses this word in a particular way. And with any author, really, there are ways that a writer might tend to use a certain word. Just one more example on that. I listened to um, a lot of Renewing Your Mind in college and right out of college with R.C. Sproul. And if you listen to him for long enough, you begin to pick up on certain habits that he has. And so I noticed that he used the word beloved a lot. And all of you, you hear that word beloved and something comes to mind to you. Um, and when he had a point to emphasize or he wanted to draw attention to what he was about to say, he wouldn't call us brothers and sisters. He would call us beloved or as a reminder that we are beloved by God. And that's not the word, way that everybody uses that term beloved. I have my own version of beloved and it's reserved for my wife. Um, but R.C. Sproul had a way of doing that. So when he used that word, it would call us to pay attention and to listen to what he's about to say. And so think of Paul doing the same thing with the word mystery. Whenever Paul uses the term mystery in his writing, it has to do with the Old Testament prophecy. 
there was something in the Old Testament that had pointed to something else that was not fully understood until now, until he has this Poirot moment, right? And so 10 times out of 10, 100% of the time, if you hear Paul write about a mystery, it is going to be about something in the Old Testament that has been revealed in a more clearer picture. And so take it in the right context. Look at the verse again, verse 2. Assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery, so how what was pointed to in the Old Testament has now been fully revealed and fulfilled, was made known to me by revelation as I have written briefly. Okay, now let's look at the other word. Something was revealed to him by revelation. Now, he doesn't give a specific example of when it may have been revealed to him, and there are plenty of examples in the New Testament of Paul receiving revelation as an apostle. You can read about his dramatic conversion in Acts 9 on the road to Damascus. Or in Acts 22, he was warned in a trance to leave where he was because he was in danger and he had to go out to the Gentiles. Uh, in Galatians 1.12, he received re- revelation. In Galatians 2.2, he shared the gospel on account of that specific revelation. And so Paul, as an apostle, was no stranger to divine revelation. But it's not It's not important when the specific revelation came to him in this case. I think it's likely at his conversion. But what matters in this text is that there was a point in Paul's life where it was not clear, and then there was a point in life for Paul where it was made abundantly clear. And why is that? Because Paul's purpose was planned. God knew what he was doing with Paul. He knew what he was doing. And Paul gives us a hint at the end of verse 3. And he said that uh, he had already wrote briefly about this mystery and this this revelation. In the beginning of the letter, back to chapter 1, verse 9, we looked at it already, but it said that God, making known to us the mystery of his will, that's the mystery that Paul is referring to right now, that's what he wrote about, according to what? His purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time. Paul had a purpose in prison. Paul's purpose was planned. And so God revealed the mystery through revelation to Paul at exactly the right moment. And the third and final point, Paul's purpose is for you. It's for you. Verses four and five, look at that with me. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. And so this letter uh, likely would have been read aloud uh, to a gathering of the Ephesians. So he's saying, look, God revealed this mystery to me. He gave me special insight, uh, but it's not meant for me alone. He's saying, all you have to do is read these words that we're reading from this scroll or papyrus, whatever it's on, um, and you are going to understand what has been unknown for generations. The apostles, they know now. The prophets, they know now. The Spirit has made it clear. That's what he's saying. That's why I'm writing this. Now you need to know. And what is this great mystery that Paul's been talking about? He's going to make it clear for you in verse 6. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. So he sums up, all of chapter 1 and chapter 2 in verse 6 here. Everybody knew, really, um, you know, there was plenty of Old Testament texts that pointed that the Gentiles would eventually be included in the worship of God. You can read uh, Genesis 12, 3, and God's promise to Abraham. He says that all of the nations would be blessed through Abraham. But what wasn't clear, what had to be revealed to Paul by God to make clear, was that there are faithful, believing Gentiles And they were going to have a place of equal importance alongside faithful, believing Jews. Paul stresses that here clearly. And even a better way to understand how clear Paul is being is to read it closer to how it would have been perceived by the original audience. So he would have um, have said something along the line of, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel. Members of the same body together with Israel partakers of the promise together with Israel in Christ Jesus through the gospel. He uses this language of of unity all throughout Ephesians. 
I mean, think of how many times we read about the words us and the word we and the word our when we went through chapter two. And then the rest of Ephesians is filled with language just like, uh, like all and the whole body and together. He's abundantly clear. You Gentiles, which means you, Fayette Baptist Church, you have been adopted together with all believers through Jesus Christ. Amen? Now just think for a minute how radical that statement would have sounded at the time. Think of the prejudices that existed between these two groups of people. Paul was imprisoned, I'm going to add, not just because of his efforts to preach the gospel. He was imprisoned because of his efforts to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. In Acts 21, 28, we read how Paul was arrested, how he was accused of teaching heresy against the Jews, and moreover, for being complicit in allowing Greeks or Gentiles into the temple. And Paul didn't actually bring anyone into the temple, uh, but he was preaching that God was making one new person out of two. And if you keep reading in Acts, you'll find um, that Paul is given a chance to defend himself. And so he uses this as an opportunity, essentially, to share his testimony, to share the gospel, and how Jesus appeared to him on the road to Damascus, and how he was sent initially by Jesus to preach to the Jews. Um, and up until that point, the crowd was attentive. And they were respectful, and they were quiet, and they were listening. And then Paul quotes Jesus and tells the crowd what Jesus told him, how Jesus told him to go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. And it was that statement when he was arrested that caused the crowd to break into chaos. As soon as he mentioned going to the Gentiles, the crowd raised their voices, and the statement was strong enough that they were saying to him, away with such a fellow from the earth. They were saying he should not be allowed to live. So they were willing to execute Paul for his willingness to go to the Gentiles, to go to people just like you. There was this barrier. It was clear and evident in Paul's days between Jews and Gentiles. And Paul said that God was tearing that barrier down. And I know that there are barriers today that you can think of in your own life, in our own world. And I'm here to tell you, Paul is here to tell you that God is tearing those barriers down. And when he broke down that wall between the Jews and the Gentiles, he didn't do it uh, with some sort of uneasy truce between the two groups. He did it to bring them together, to complete unity, to becoming one. Now, remember the reason Paul starts off with the first verse. What does he say? For this reason, I, Paul, because at the end of chapter 2, we are joined together, we are built together into one dwelling place for God by the Spirit. That was the great mystery that Paul was imprisoned for. God has a purpose for the Gentiles in his new holy temple. He has a purpose for you in his temple. We see that over and over and over in Ephesians. There is purpose. Purpose. Purposed by Christ purposed with Paul in mind, and now we read that, look, he has you in mind too. Don't for a second believe that you are an afterthought in God's plan. Don't believe the lie that you are so far gone that the grace that you felt you were given must have been a mistake because it was not a mistake. It's a mystery now revealed. You are not an accident. And you may be telling yourself, all right, I get the picture. Okay, you're being a little repetitive. But don't stop repeating it to yourself. In the middle of prison, in the middle of persecution, Paul clung on to that purpose. And in the middle of wherever you are, whatever you are going through, whatever situation is happening in your life, cling to that purpose that Paul clung to. Paul's purpose was not in the hands of an idol God, but was in the one, or but was in the hands of the one who intimately knew Paul. It was in the hands of a God who loved Paul before the foundations of the world and set him apart exactly so he could write that letter from prison. The truth that he lays out in that letter from prison to the Ephesians is a truth that is meant to reveal that purpose for you today. You can't lose sight of that. And there may come a time, and I'm willing to bet that some of you in this room are feeling like you're in that time, or you do, you feel like your salvation was a mistake. Like maybe you were wrong. Like there's no part 
for you in redemption. There's no place for you in his temple. You see your own sin and you think, how can I possibly be welcomed into his presence? Surely God could not have meant to give me grace. Well, in closing, if that's you, or if that ever becomes you, take these words in Ephesians and do not let them go. Look at these with me. Ephesians 1, 4, and 5. In love, he predestined us, predestined you, for adoptions as son through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. In him, verse 7, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses. And yes, chapter 2, verse 1, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Verse 4, but God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, which he loved you, even when we, even when you were dead in your trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. Ephesians 2, 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Verse 14, for he himself is our peace. He's your peace. Who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. Verse 18, for through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. These are promises that he's telling you. In him, in verse 22, you also, put your name there, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Do not let those words go. There is purpose through the blood of Christ in prison or in your home for a first century Pharisee or for a 21st century church member. It's purpose for Paul, purpose for me, and this purpose for you. Let's pray. Well, Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for what has been revealed to us and that for centuries was not known. We thank you that, oh man, God, your grace is so good and so big that you couldn't leave us out of it. You extended your grace to us you extended your mercy to us, Lord, and you're doing it with a reason. And so, God, I ask that you would help us to cling to that purpose that we have. But I ask that you would help us to make it our chief end, where we, would, where we wake up every morning in love with you, where we go to bed every night in love with you, and we would always be reminded, even in the darkest days that we have, that you love us and that your grace is not a mistake. So Lord, we lift up all of these things in your name. Amen.
Lord, your your goodness is overwhelming. Your grace to us is overwhelming. Lord, I think about that uh, slide that came up during Jeff's sermon that said, there is a purpose for everything. And the purpose is to show your goodness. So Lord, help us to live our lives to show your goodness. Help us to show your love to the world. And Lord, I pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Have a great week, everybody.